All right. Good evening. My name is Tracy Schultz. I'm the chair of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Reconstruction Advisory Group. And I'm in the meeting of the advisory group. And hereby call the meeting to order at, what did you say, 603 something? 603. <laughs> we are holding this meeting in person at the MBTA Police Building at the Bay Bridge. Attendees should note that this meeting is being recorded and will be available on the BRAG webpage after the meeting for attendees to view and download. Attendees should also note that the recording will be will include the audio and video from this evening's meeting. Presentations will be available to download from the BRAG webpage. I would ask anyone in the room with us this evening, please refrain from speaking unless you are presenting or answering questions so that background noise is minimized for those viewing remotely. If members of the public free register to comment on a specific agenda item, I will provide you with an opportunity to comment after the agenda item is presented. We appreciate everyone's patience and ask that you hold any comments until the designated time. We ask that you please introduce yourself by giving us your name, community you represent, before moving on with your question or comment. Members of the public joining us via Microsoft Teams will be able to view the meeting only. For security reasons, the chat function at Microsoft Teams is not enabled for MDOT personnel. Any posts entered in the chat window are not visible to staff and will not be responded to. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded in its entirety. For the record, all members present except for uh, Steve Wilson and Peter Bradley. We have uh, David Arthur joining us virtually. Before we move on to our first agenda item, there are some membership updates. In October, we lost an important member of the BRAG with sudden passing of MBTA Executive Director Joey Segal. Although Joey only attended one BRAG meeting in his capacity as a member, he was nonetheless a familiar face at meetings in his previous capacity as an MBTA Chief Operating Officer. Joey was an integral team member of both the MBTA and the MDOT State Highway Administration. Spent in more than two decades as a devoted public servant. His contributions were highly valued and will be missed. On behalf of the BRAG, I extend sincere condolences to his family and friends. With Joey's passing, Percy Dangerfield Percy, was appointed as the acting MBTA Executive Administrator. Mr. Dangerfield previously served as a Chief Administration Officer for the MBTA. I now turn the floor over to Percy to introduce himself. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Now, good morning or good evening to the members of the BRAG. Um, as the Chair stated, my name is Percy Dangerfield. I'm the acting Executive Director for Maryland Transportation Authority. Um, as I was talking to Jack a little earlier, I'm sort of giving him some background. I've been in public service for about 30 years and the transportation sector for about 25 years. I spent some time working the State Highway Administration, also spent some time working for the Cleveland Airport System, and I've been with MBTA for the last 10 years as Chief Administrative Officer. So I really appreciate the opportunity. I look forward to working for everybody, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for that, Peter. Join us. If you have any question or thing as we go along, just kick in and ask questions. Yes, sir. But also, um, welcome Mr. John Foster to the brag. Mr. Foster was appointed by the governor in November to replace Barbara Hitchens. Barbara was a consistent brag member from the very beginning of the group back in 2005 and has exemplified the goals and objectives of the brag throughout her tenure. I'd like to thank her for her many years of dedicated service to the brag. I extend a warm welcome to Mr. Foster on behalf of the Bragg and now turn the floor over to him for an introduction. Thanks, Chair. Thanks so much. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, very excited to meet you all. I'm John Foster. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of a company out of Baltimore, Maryland called Fearless. I actually live right down the street here in the Peninsula. Um, my kids go to local elementary schools and middle schools in the area and then we go to Broadnick High School. And my wife is from the Eastern Shore. So all the things that you all have been talking about over the years, we have experienced that as a family. I'm very excited to be a part of the board and thanks so much for uh, the opportunity to address you all. Thank you. You're lucky to have an Eastern Shore woman there too. Yeah. <laughs> for the benefit of Percy and David, could each member of the BRAG please state their name and the community they represent? So we'll start moving down the street. Nick Diotis, I live in Queenstown, across the bridge. And I still commute four days or so across the bridge, back and forth. Been on, I've been here probably since 2013. I'm Tracy Schultz, I'm the chair. Um, I'm from the Eastern Shore, I'm the Canal Volunteer Fire Department for 45 years. So we respond calls on the bridge. Uh, our family has two restaurants, Eastern Shore. So we're pretty familiar with the bridge and, and the traffic backs up to Hertz's. Our businesses and stuff that we try to keep 
things going the best we can. Yeah. Nice being on this committee. A good group of people on here. Appreciate everybody's time. Uh, Jack Broderick, uh, Ken Allen, good old Eastern Shore. Um, I'm involved with a number of different community organizations uh, and have been part of the BRAG. Since before we were the BRAG, we were a bunch of ad hoc, um, angry Ken Allen people said, man, you got to do it better. And they tried to do it. Asked if we would uh, consider being part of uh, the official brag. It's been an honor. It really has. Um, I enjoy working with Barbara. We understand political changes and we certainly welcome uh, John on here. But I, uh, you know, we'll miss, we'll miss Barbara. Um, but, you know, we've had some really good members over the years, uh, both from the staff and uh, members of the community. And I, I value being part of this group. And thank you for this. Um, for this opportunity. So I'm Will Pines. I'm a state highway administrator uh, for the last five months ish now. Prior to that, I was executive director of the Maryland Transportation Authority. So lots of prior Bay Bridge experience. Welcome to the, both of the new members. I had the opposite experience. I'm from the Eastern Shore, but married a Western Shore girl. And <laughs> totally the opposite. That she pulled me over here. I followed her, not the other way around. So, but I uh, look forward to working with you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lynn Barrow. I represent Secretary Paul Wiedefeld on the board. Um, I live in Annapolis. Um, I think that's why I'm here. <laughs> and I've lived in Annapolis for about the past 20 years. I joined um, MDOT in February. I worked with Secretary Wiedefeld when he was the director of MAA, which is the Maryland Aviation Administration. And believe it or not, that was 20 years ago. And so I've been gone from this, from state government. I had been gone from state government for 20 years and glad to be back. So, um, and I do, I do enjoy this board and, and the work. I'm learning a lot. That's what I'll say. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, uh, my name is Jim Moran. I'm the president of Queen's County Commissioners. It's just started my 11th year as the at-large commissioner in Queen's County and all 11 years have been dedicated to this beautiful set of bridges. So, uh, you know, it, this organization has done more in the last three to four years than it has prior 10. Oh, I mean, things, yeah. things, things are going extremely well. Um, very proud of uh, part of this, you know, the brag, and, and uh, I look forward for our, you know, work in you know, the team working together in the future to see what else we can do to. Help alleviate some of the, you know, the, the traffic that everybody loves to complain about. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> My name is Donald Schwartz. Oh, oh, excuse me, Donald. David's prepared to introduce himself oh. from virtually. He, he's virtual. He's virtual. Can you unmute yourself, David? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, my name is David Arthur. Uh, I've been a resident of Annapolis, Maryland all my life. Grew up here, have family here. Um, I'm very proud to be part of this board. I've learned so much over the last couple of months. I'm able to press all my friends at parties with the knowledge I've learned about the Bay Bridge. So I'm going to hit at parties <laughs> and thank you all very much. Um, I'm a frequent uh, visitor to the Eastern Shore. Uh, we've been, you know, the, bay, uh, the, be the beach area has been, a, I'm a beach goer, so I've been there a lot. My band plays on the Eastern Shore several times, so I appreciate all the work that everybody's done and just want to extend a welcome to the two new gentlemen. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. My name is still Donald Schlaff. <laughs> I live in the Apple Heights community in Annapolis. And this is my third year uh, being part of BRAC. My name is Pat Lynch, and I'm president of the Broadnet Council. And I'm also vice chair of the Growth Action Network, which is a countywide advocacy organization. Here. We work very closely with the county on legislation. And, uh, I retired from 28 years with the IBM Corporation in 02, and I haven't had a day off since then. <laughs> uh, happy to be with you all. I actually formed the Broadneck Council in 07 with the objective of uh, fixing fixing the problems with the traffic on Route 50. I, I only live two miles away, so I'm in the of it. And uh, so far, I've made a little progress, but not a whole heck of a lot. So I'm here for the duration, guys. 
reason. So, Mr. Brad is on his own line, is he? Yeah, no. Okay, make sure we hmm? get the joints. All right, as a, um, while we was Greg vice chair, her departure leaves a position vacant. Working with the bylaws, we now vote on a new vice chair. May I please have a nomination? I'd like to nominate Jack Barber. Second. Vice second. One else? Except. Was it second? No. I second. No. Two seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There you have the first and second for Jack Broder to be vice chair. All in favor? Uh, aye. And one against? <laughs> Mr. Do you think I'm lying? Miss Mr. Arthur, are you in favor? Aye. Sorry, I couldn't get off mute. Aye. Thank you. Let me just make a comment. I I do appreciate that. Um, I'll do my best to support Tracy in uh, in the brag at where we're going. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, guys. Next, we have an agenda item review of the minutes from the previous meeting held in October. Um, we asked, we sent them out originally if anyone has any changes. And we don't usually get any back. We do a very good job of uh, keeping them straight on those. So, um, if there's no changes, I'd like to have a motion to accept as read. So I'll second. second. Okay. All in favor? Uh, aye. Anyone against? Thank you. Next, we have our group agenda item is a requirement of House Bill 56, which is a report on the group's activities since the last meeting and any recommendations they have based on these activities. As for bribe duties, they are to provide MBTA with an independent citizen informed perspective with authorities, operations at the Bay Bridge, assess potential concerns about activities at the Bay Bridge, educate the public about activity relating to the Bay Bridge, and work with the MBTA to provide pertinent input related to traffic and customer service issues. Would any members like to share their individual educational activities and interactions with the community since last week? Nick, I think you've been down a little bit under weather, sir. Um, I um, continue to have um, you know, online with different people and different discussions and different uh, um, neighborhood groups now. Yeah, it's a kind of getting a very extensive. Um, um, system and like Ken Island, different different neighborhoods with uh, their own website or their own, you know, their, uh, what we call it Facebook site. Yeah. And it's very interesting what goes on there. But the biggest thing I hear now is everybody's talking about westbound back, the westbound back, which that seems to be the eastbound is accepted, is accepted now. It's expected. Uh, the question is how many miles. And the, that the westbound is, is catching people by surprise. And uh, it, it, uh, it's obviously a problem for um, emergency services, which you know firsthand, not to mention for business owners and try to do a little business on the weekends. So, and even even the, uh, well, then the other day we had that terrible accident down by, uh, Pippin Farm Lane and um, Kingstown. That was Kingstown. Yeah. The Route 50 was closed for what, four, four hours? Both ways, both directions. You can imagine what that was like. Um, the people were routing you know, through the, through the, uh, the side streets of uh, Denton. Well, not too, too Denton, but you know, off of 404, they tried to get over 301. And it was quite a mess for a while. But, uh, you know, these are the things we have. Um, and uh, we just got to do the best of it. We, we certainly, Melissa gets out a lot of information on the uh, internet. So if you want to know if the bridge is backed up, Melissa will let you know. <laughs> she, she, she's there before the cars get there. So, uh, All right. That's, that, that's what I have to say. Oh. I just went to the meeting they had for the Main Street. They're just trying to uh, do some, I guess, 
alterations to Main Street and to increase the capacity, I guess what they're trying to do there. Um, Castle Marina Road to Penton Airs adding shoulder and stuff. It really doesn't have to do with the bridge, but it will with backups it helps should help some hopefully because traffic through there. So I think that meeting pretty much what I've done. Yeah. Um <clears throat> Yeah, I was at that same meeting at SHA meeting at fire department a couple of weeks ago. Um, looking at, as Tracy said, road really improvements. But what what I heard from that was was almost a little cynical from a number of folks in that, you know, all these guys are doing is showing us what we already know and documented the problems and what we're looking for is solutions. So I just pass that on but is uh, Folks are obviously highly interested, as Tracy and Nick have said, and looking for solutions. And, and you know, they're hard to come by. Um, but the meeting, I think, was helpful. But we just, you know, we need to continue to, to do that kind of public stuff. Um, I've heard a lot. I continue to hear a lot of feedback. Well, you know, number one, the darn westbound backup. And what we can do, and it always, you know, Jamie and I were talking about it before. It always seems like, you know, grass is green on the other side. You know, the uh, eastbound end is backed up as bad as westbound, but it's a, I know it's a judgment call. And uh, what I appreciate is the, uh, the openness and the the approachability you got, Richard, and when you were there, and Jamie, you know, is. is there's a dialogue and I, I get hit with a lot of stuff from, from a lot of people around the island. And I'm able to share what's really going on. And I think because people understand that I might have some insight, they keep hitting me with stuff. There's a limit to that, believe me. And, and that's when I make a phone call. <laughs> uh, there's continuing concern about the tier two study and where the heck it's going to cross Cat Island and what the impact is going to be. Um, I got a call the other day and we were talking before about one of the contractors working on this uh, community outreach and have offered to help uh, set up any meetings or, or open this at any local events. And, and that's a that's an offer that, that really uh, goes without saying. Um, the the issue that I know you guys will and Jim, you got the, uh, you know, <laughs> the ramp closure issue, what we're going to do next year. I hear two sides of that. One, there are folks that are saying, uh, well, you know, at least they're trying something. It may not have worked, but at least it's an effort to try something. Um, it's very different than what we have on the, on the Western Shore going east, but uh, backing up all the traffic down Route 8, I've heard more stuff, about, and that's documented in the minutes of last time around. Um, you know, keep keep working on it. You know, just the best I can say, it's it's a tough one, um, and involve local people. But I, I wish I could say more. But I, you know, um, we're trying out there, and as much as I can be helpful to you guys, so I really want to do it. I can respond to a couple of things there yeah, if, yeah. if it helps. Um, so on the Route 18 study, like many of the conversations we've had about studies, a lot of times the way that uh, folks would like for it to work is that we say what the outcomes would look like and then they get to respond to that. Yeah. But then that raises the criticism that we came up with the outcomes without getting the input on what the output should be. Okay. And that just can't be how we work, right? We have to lay out the, the problems, talk about possible solutions around the problems, and sort of work our way up to alternatives analysis and, and the normal study process. So we go through that a lot where it, on the one hand, there are folks that want us to be further along in the study than what we are. And the flip side of that is if we ever did anything that was too far along, then we get in trouble for it. Yeah. So um, we are where we are on 18. That's going to the study process is going to continue and that's going to be fully public and available to comment. 
let us know the thoughts there. And eventually that will lead to alternatives that are presented that the public would then be able to comment. But we got to do that methodically like we do all studies. And, you know, it's a process. Too. So in terms of the um, rent management pilot, I'm going to talk more about that when I get into the project updates. But we definitely heard the feedback. We've had some post-mortem debriefings with the county and our, we've done a traffic analysis that we're going to meet with them this month to kind of talk about that further. And we expect to have further public discussion. On this. So that's, we, we kind of said that all along that there'd be more public dialogue about the rent management process. Unfortunately, the Western shore turned out to be easier than the oh, Eastern shore. Direction. But the, you know, in the vein of the keep working at it, I think one of the reasons that it took us as long as it did to try something is that many of the concepts that have been thrown out there, um, tolling for everybody except for locals, closing the entrance rooms, you know, you, you've heard it all here multiple times. Those options are not legal. And we've been through that. We got federal highway letters that we provided to the group. So we Within the legal framework, we've done an option that is legal, um, but it's it's challenging. So we've, we're going to talk about what mitigation measures we might be able to do, but um, I'll talk more about it. I don't know if Jim wanted to add anything further to that, his perspective. I didn't mean to steal your button. <laughs> There's not the one thing question on Main Street project, because I'm you're looking to study now. How long would it be for funding to be available once it's... That's something that's yeah, asked that's near the hardest question to be asked. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not, one not really available to. No, to yeah, we're not funded beyond the study phase. Right, so okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I'll wait to hear what you make your updates, a little, little conversation about that. But, you know, the RIF study, some people said it was a total failure. Some people said that they could see some change, but you know, again, it was it was the perfect storm with a you know massive accident on the bridge. But uh, you know, I think we're gonna we're gonna tiptoe back out into that pond again. That comes springtime and, and summer and, and try it again. So looking forward to to seeing much better results. Um, you know, the the, the Main Street study. Uh, we're, we're we're happy to see that it's the beginning of something. So, uh, and and you, I'm realistic about it. You know, we know the funding is 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 a huge issue for the next three four years. Uh, so you know things aren't gonna things aren't gonna happen as quickly as we hope. Uh, I just hope and pray that we can maintain the status on the, the phase two of the NEPA, get to the end of phase two of the NEPA, and move on from there, and while protecting MDTAs. <clears throat> Toll monies to keep it with the toll with the bridges. So, you know, I, I look forward to you know, helping any way I can with that. Uh, we have our legislators in Annapolis. Uh, hopefully, soon we'll be introducing some legislation on the red X's cameras so that we can, you know, that's the biggest complaint that we hear is when traffic does get backed up, everybody just jumps in the red X lane and just rides it all the way down. And, and you know, people lose their mind over that stuff. So, you know, uh, Anything we can do to stop that, and, and uh, it makes the MDTA some money in the in the, in the uh, meantime. That's never a bad thing. So, you know, there a lot is happening, uh, and and hopefully more will will come about uh, from our legislators uh, with that. And we'll have to wait and see where that takes us. Uh, Jim, you want to add after every meeting, I run off some copies of uh, the proceedings and distribute them to uh, my neighbors. We always have a discussion uh, of what transpired. And uh, I also take them to my poker buddies. <laughs> <laughs> they are always asking. Pretty much it. Come to order. Do you have anything you want to say? He can hear you. No, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing on my end. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. What? Uh, because of my heading up uh, different board positions on the Broadneck Council and Growth Action Network, 
we reach about 10,000 uh, individuals. Cape St. Clair is a member of my board, and uh, so that's a city in itself. And then uh, a, a growth action network, we reach about 20,000, very active and uh, comprehensive. Wherever I am, I'm always the head of the transportation committee, so I can always talk about what you're doing uh, here. So we have meetings, newsletters. I always have a section on transportation. Uh, I want to say thank you for what you all did on those ramps. There may have been some negatives probably on the Eastern Shore, but I have walked into meetings where people have run up to me and said, thank you Super. so much for what you, you, know, you all have done in, in uh, taking care of uh, exit 30 and 32. And it made life so much easier. I know myself, I, would, I dread the summer weekends. And it was so much easier for me going across, you know, to Cape St. Clair. I take St. Margaret's Road and Cape St. Clair. So it, it was a winner for us. I, I thought there's not much we can do. You know, as I said, I've been here how many years? Um, since 07, I think I started. Anyway, uh, nothing. There's only so much we can do until we get a new span and we know where it is. And we're all waiting for that. But it was a little step and it worked for us. Thank you. John's new first meeting. Oh, everything we talk about in there, nice people bring back from the meetings they have. We they incorporate that into the yearly um, and report that we have to the governor. We have to submit a report to the governor, what we've been going through. So, take all the minutes and all the stuff that we bring back, what we've been doing, and uh, put that into part of the report. So, any meetings you have or anything, talk to anybody, just feel free to. Yeah, I, I figured this question was going to come up, so I did come a little bit prepared. Um, much like Pat, a lot of the, the folks that I interact with are on the peninsula. So uh, fixing the branch situation has been, you know, a tremendous blessing to everybody up and down College Parkway. So so thank you so much for that. Um, and I'll continue to, to you know, learn things. I don't want to backtrack on things you already talked about or excuse they already, you know, planning to, to go through. So I'll just keep my mouth shut and just listen for a moment. <laughs> Okay. All right. Our next um, agenda item is some updates on current projects from MDTA Chief Engineer Jim Hartness and MDOT SHA Administrator Will Pines. Oh, he's one good picture. Is that married me? <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jim Harkness. I'm the chief engineer for the Maryland Transportation Authority. Uh, tonight, I'll be uh, going over uh, our updates on the projects on the Bay Bridge. Uh, I also have a little information uh, requested at the last meeting on traffic patterns, correlation with uh, crash patterns, as well as an update on um, our dehumidification project from a couple of years ago. Um, so, but first we'll start with uh, the current uh, projects. Let's see. Okay, okay. okay. thanks. Um, first project is BB3013. That is our phone call um, repairs and Mr. Lillania's modifications contract. Uh, again, this is a uh, a task order based contract um, to perform repairs on steel, concrete, uh, anything miscellaneous that is found during our inspection program. Um, this uh, contract currently has 43 task orders um, with the contractor, and we have uh, completed 41 task orders to date. Um, this project, uh, it will be Followed up by a, a, a subsequent project on here that's again design. Uh, and this is like a cyclical contracts that we uh, we put out to maintain the the bridges we have. Moving on to the the next project, it is BB thirty twelve, a Q detection system. So again, this is a project we are working on with our partners at SHA and at the University of Maryland's CAT Lab. Um, the project was to develop a Q warning and travel time system that our operations team can utilize. Um, we'll tell them how long, uh, measure the, the length of traffic queues, um, measure the vehicles approaching the bridge from both directions, uh, and uh, you know, therefore figure out the, the delays uh, on each side of the bridge. Um, 
that project is in basically two phases. So the first phase is, is essentially wrapped up with only a little bit of the CCTV camera work remaining. Um, that should be done here this spring. Um, the CAT lab has delivered on the first portion of the software for our operators to be able to view uh, the, the data that's coming in from the, um, the roadway. Uh, now we are working with them to kind of get phase two underway, which will take um, their algorithm that they developed, the software, and put a predictive um, a feature in that where they're taking the data that our sensors are seeing on the roadway and kind of trying to anticipate um, what the cues will look like a certain period of time in the future so that we can uh, be proactive instead of reactive. Uh, so that's that project. Moving on to the next one, BB3017. That's our eastbound um, deck replacement phase one package one. So Again, this is uh, the project that will be replacing the deck um, uh, between the, the main span, the main suspension span and the two truss span on the eastbound bridge. Um, we're also upgrading the barrier. Uh, we are kind of doing some structural repairs while we're there, uh, replacing the signal gantries that uh, hold the lane use control signals uh, and doing uh, utility relocations. Uh, currently we have stair towers and truss platforms out there on the bridge those are being moved as uh you know they're being constructed and deconstructed as necessary and moved to different sections of the bridge wherever the work's going um we started in t22 which is the furthest from where we are here we're working this way so that's all underneath the bridge you don't see much uh, other than um the, the the booms on the cranes um but uh, we we are we started in 22 and we're now starting to work in 19. So there's different various uh, phases of work in each of those truss uh, sections. Um, but uh, we are doing truss strengthening. So we finished the first section. We're in the second section, truss strengthening. Got the barrier uh, bearings all installed in the first section, moving to barriers in the second section. Um, and so we are really, uh, you know, essentially ramping up to where we're getting ready to do the the major panel work. Um, so we have a casting yard in Curtis Bay that was completely set up. Um, they started casting um, <clears throat> some panels out there. Um, and, and so those panels are going through the curing and testing process right now. Um, additionally, while that's happening, we have a stormwater management pond uh, that is um, has started has started work. And so um, essentially, with all this happening, it looks like the deck panel replacement will um, should be ready by uh, February, early February uh, of this year. Of this year. Yep. Um, so we'll be starting that uh, this year. We have a little video to show you at the end of uh, my my talk here, so we'll uh, we'll be putting that out as part of our outreach plan. Uh, get folks ready for this again. All goes according to plan. It all happens overnight. <laughs> no one's uh, any of the wiser that uh, we got in and out um, while everybody or most people were asleep. You know, Jim, if I could comment, um, it sounds so just bizarre cutting out pieces of the bridge, lifting them out, putting it back in. But when that happened, I, and I know I've said this before, on the westbound span, it was 156 panels were replaced. The very first one was a screw up. Everything else worked perfectly. The system works, even though it just seems counterintuitive. So we're hoping the same success happens, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's what we're making sure, you know, okay. we, we did a, a different type of procurement process, working with the contractor to try to, um, you know, try to do the best we can to guarantee these things. We've worked hard to minimize um, impacts, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, different, you know, the bumps that you may have while we're placing panels out there. So we, we think we have a good design that should minimize that, um, you know, but things happen. So we're even trying to plan for contingencies should something kind of uh, happen in the middle of one of these replacements. So we we, we have a plan together and we're, we, you know, it's, it's, it's coming together and we're, um, yeah, we're anxious to get to February and see what, see what we can do. 
<laughs> we're all rooting for you. <laughs> um, all right, so with that, we'll go on to uh, fourth project there, BB3021. Again, I mentioned this earlier, this is the replacement um, or the, the follow-up contract. It's another on-call structural repair, so it's just a continuation essentially of the of the first project that I went over. Um, the schedule on this one is that we would be sending it to our procurement folks uh, this month with an advertisement um, of the contract this spring and hoping to you know, get a contractor on board to start <clears throat> by the fall of this year. And my last project is BB 3004. That's the construct the maintenance equipment storage building. So talked last time about how we kind of rescope this. So we held a, a design coordination meeting to kind of go over the, the revised scope. We had a follow up meeting on the, the water line that we're having to, to get down to the site down there. Um, so the, the schedule on this one is about, a, you know, we have to re permit it, um, you know, rework the design. So 12 to 15 months uh, for that, uh, go through the procurement. We're looking at taking bids in fall of 25 on that project with construction starting two years from this point. So that's that project. Um, so kind of getting off of the, the contracts, the projects, but you know, one of the items we talked about last time at our meeting in October was just looking at um, the volume trends up on the bridge. So volumes uh, for this past summer, June, July, August, were up by more than 3% as compared to 22. So we saw more about 3% more volume uh, for those over those three months on average. Uh, so then we wanted to look at what did that mean in terms of those crashes. Um, so the crash rate, which is a you know essentially a way to normalize the crash numbers, um, the crash rate was down uh, for 23 compared to 22 and even 21. So we saw a lower crash rate. Um, so that means for the number of crashes for the number of vehicles we saw, we saw a decrease in that. So we saw less crashes out there. Um, you know, the types of crashes we were seeing, rear ends uh, essentially stayed the same. So um, no change in rear end crashes. Fixed objects went up slightly. So it's not a big number, but we put gates in the roadway and they get in. <laughs> so um, we, you know, that, that alone has kind of driven that number, uh, you know, up from where it was uh, in prior years. And then side swipe crashes were down, and that's where we saw a reduction in. Uh, those types of crashes. Uh, just kind of framing, you know, where we saw the highest crashes. August was the highest uh, month of the three months for crashes. Wednesdays were the day with the lowest crashes. And you can probably guess, but Saturday, Sundays had the highest number of crashes, right? Highest volumes, but I have the highest numbers. And then, uh, you know, some of the common factors for the crashes out on on the bridge is the failure to give your full attention um, that may be distracted driving, but it's also another other, other things and then follow too closely. So it's just kind of a, a brief summary on, um, you know, of the, of some of the crash rate and how that ties to the volume. So we saw out there. Yes. Do you have any idea why we've improved on the accident rate? Uh, well, we were under construction with those yeah, the projects cleanup. on each side. Right. Yeah. Um, so we removed the toll plaza um, and then we did the, the projects for the automated lane closure system. So we were kind of more in a, con a heavy construction um, for those two years. So typically, you, you know, you, you might see that, um, you know, see a see an improvement. I think just moving the, the toll yeah. area. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that, alone, so, that alone, we've seen a, a good sure. crashes if you look. Just at so this was looking at the entire stretch of the bridge, um, the, not the bridge itself, but also the approaches there that, that we have. So it was it was looking at everything. And, but if you look just at the toll plaza area, it's a it's a very steep uh, improvement in safety at the toll, uh, the whole toll plaza area. Mr. Arthur has his hand up online. Okay. Good afternoon. First, I want to apologize for not being there in person. Uh, I found out this morning that a family member I was with this weekend came down with COVID, so I just want to be safe to sorry and not impact anybody else. So my apologies for not being there. Uh, my question is around the queue detection system. Uh, I'm going to assume that sort of the algorithm based on some sort of AI formula. 
Is that correct? Um, yeah, so there was a little bit of some, uh, you know, that we, we did kind of a, a neural network development um, with some deep learning on, on the data that was available. And so that's how we had a phase one that was able to produce uh, a system for us. Um, but that was based on historic data. And as I said, we don't want to be reactive. We wanted to try to create a, the, the goal of this project was to create something that was um, proactive um, to sort of project conditions before they come so we can make better decisions uh, and timely decisions. And so now that's phase two, we'll take the data that we're collecting on the roadway in real time or near real time and, and feed it into the um, in, into that into the model, AI model or deep learning, and, and then churn out um, hopefully um, actionable data or information for us. And I guess my question is, with like most AI system, it has a learning curve. It's got to learn the patterns in order to provide some valuable information. Do you have a, a estimate on how long it will take to you know become you know uh, I don't say sentient. We don't want that, but to be able to provide valuable uh, information. Um, well, the, the benefit of kind of the phase one was that it took all, uh, it took historic data. Um, it was just the data that it was using was uh, limited. It wasn't a full data set. Um, it was from a uh, traffic data provider that uses uh, probe data, probe vehicle data. So it's not the entire uh, volume of vehicles that you would be getting your data from. It's a, it's a limited data set, so, but we were able to seed it with that. And so it, it's had years, uh, it has years of data there. And then what we'll be able to do is bring on the real-time data and hopefully really shorten that curve. Well, marry it with the legacy data. All right, cool, cool, thank you, appreciate it. Do you plan on making any of that data like consumer facing, because consumer, consumer, consumable? Um, you know, I got a, uh, not sure if that, uh, so like our, a lot of our data is available uh, public facing uh, through our SAJ chart um, partners. And I would have to double check, but that data may be out there. Uh, it's it's essentially radar uh, on the side of the road, side fire radar um, that just collects, you know, information about speed and occupancy and, and volume. Question. Question. All right. Um, well, and then so, uh, yeah, I would uh, be going into a the presentation that I have for uh, that you have in front of you. New materials. It's on the um, the humidification project. It's just an up, it's sort of a figure out what you do just a, an update, but sort of a brief uh, review of the of the materials for this project. So. Um, we have a, a project, uh, well, basically a decade ago already, um, that uh, installed a humidification system on the suspension cables for both bridges. Uh, and so, uh, on the, this cable humid uh, dehumidification system was the first one installed in North America. Uh, was here at the at, at the bridge. Um, it was installed in in, in Europe, um, but uh, it was the first one in North America. Um, there are several other bridge owners that have either installed this, a similar system or, or are currently installing it. Um, so as you can see, it was February of 14, so just under a decade ago when the first one was commissioned, upon, and that's on the westbound bridge or the north bridge, uh, and then uh, over a year later, the southbound bridge. Um, and as I said, uh, nearly a, a decade of um, operation at this point. So. Next slide, show. Uh, so the purpose of the system, uh, obviously, uh, dehumidification for removing uh, water. So uh, within the, the cable system uh, of the suspension span, uh, water gets trapped in, in those, those cables, um, those uh, steel cables. And so we want to we want to get rid of that. We want to um, eliminate that water or lower that percentage uh, of humidity. In order to um, preserve those those cables longer, um, so we want to 
protect them. Obviously, uh, you know, the bridges, uh, eastbound bridge or the south bridge opened in 1952, westbound in 73. So they, they were out there a while with this water in them. We wanted to arrest uh, further corrosion if we could by removing uh, the moisture from the cables. Um, you can see in the one diagram there sort of the progression of, of the steel uh, cable bands uh, with uh, exposure to the, the water and the, the resulting corrosion. Um, in this this graph, essentially, it's kind of showing you what the what happens with the relative humidity and how how the um, the rate of corrosion is is related to that. And so you know, sixty percent, forty percent, but you know, we want to get we want to optimally be at around forty percent on, on that uh, relative humidity number with this system. <laughs> Uh, next slide. So this is sort of a quick diagram and a, a walkthrough of it. But um, the first step is to create that uh, dry air. So we have um, a plant room or, or a couple of plant rooms actually. Um, so plant room create the the um, the dry air. We have uh, piping <clears throat> that takes it up to uh, various locations along um, the, the the cables. There's an injection sleeve, um, so the dry air is pumped in, uh, which then forces the, the moist air out to areas where we have exhaust sleeves then, and then the, uh, the, the moist air is, is exited from, from the cable system. Next slide. Okay, these are just photos of those, uh, those items there, those components of the system. So the plant room up on the upper left there, um, it is again where we're making the uh, the dry air with these, uh, and then we have the injection fans to push the air <clears throat> up into the, the the dry air pipes, which are delivering uh, the air um, to those injection sleeves there that you see. Um, what you can you can kind of see on those uh, next to the injection sleeves is is like that gray wrap. Uh, that's what keeps it airtight. Um, in the center on the bottom here, we have the exhaust sleeve. So that um, that that box you see here is actually the sensors, um, and then from that it just exhausts out to atmosphere. Right, so those sensors that I mentioned uh, allow us to have an interface um, where we're able to uh, sort of monitor the system performance. Um, so uh, we've been doing. Uh, monthly, quarterly, annual maintenance visits uh, on on different parts of the system. Uh, we're able to remotely monitor the system and uh, be able to uh, kind of charge, charge that performance of the system. Next slide. Uh, so system, uh, some of the reports that came out of there, essentially uh, on your the vertical axis, we're measuring the relative humidity again that we were concerned about. And then it's just plotted it over time. And these plots were from back in on the left 2014 it started and on the right our, our 2015. Um, essentially, the reason that we we're showing that is because the real action in the system happened at commissioning. So you can see there was high relative humidity up there near 90% and kicked it on and uh, Within on the westbound bridge, within nine to twelve months, we were down to forty percent uh, area uh, where we wanted to be. And on the eastbound bridge, uh, just two months, and we got down um, to where we wanted to be. And pretty much the system has been holding us steady um, ever since. Uh, next slide. Um, I think this is for uh, the view of the westbound bridge. Uh, westbound bridge, obviously, there's two cables, so the colors represent the two different cables uh, on the westbound bridge. Um, but you can see this is now, instead of uh, relative humidity, now we have the uh, gallons of water uh, on, on the vertical axis there and over time. And so um, in the first year, it was like two and a half gallons a day were coming out of the out of the cables, um, and then since then it dropped to you know one um, or or a half gallon a day. Um, so uh, 
Next slide, Charles. So again, you can kind of see the wrapping on the system there, the joints. Um, so, uh, you know, we have had some intermittent interruptions with systems uh, up running time and uh, we, you know, we're 10 years in. So we've had, uh, we noticed some, we have some short term needs uh, and improvements that we can, we can perform in order to keep uh, the runtime up. Uh, but then we also have long term needs uh, to upgrade the system components and extend the life of the system. So, um, other kind of notes here, even if even when we do hit those periods where where the system kind of uh, you know goes down, that high quality wrap that they were able to install uh, really does a good job of keeping that moisture out of there. So uh, when it gets back on the relative humidity as a climate function. But, uh, overall, you know, it's been a, a great, um, great system. It was a great project, and we're proud to have it here. So that's what's about that. Uh, I know it's going over the bridge every day. What is the bottom little clamshell portion on the cables? Is that for blast protection or something? Is that a safety device? It seems like there's a, you know, if you, it's almost. I, mean, I was hoping you had a picture of it. Uh, at the at the main span, where the, the cable drip, dips back down, there's, yeah. I'd say from 100 yards going down and then coming back up, there's there's an actual additional piece that was put on the bottom of the cables. A one. Oh, it's shooting. It is. It is. That's what I thought. So if there's a fire or something to help protect the cables. Gotcha. And on the deck replacement. Uh, are you saying that some of the panels have been bored? Yes. Hmm. I know that there's, I mean, I know you've had the, the, what do you call it, where the, the panels are set, then you pour in between the panels? Closure pours. Excuse me? Closure pours. Well, the, 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 the mixed design you're using for that? Yeah. I thought that was what was poured and tested, not, not, not an existing panel that's going to be in. As far as I understand, there's no panels that have been poured that are going to be brought out here and, and put in the in the place yet. Uh, no, we should. We have uh, four. Poured. Okay, good. That's good. How That's long good news. Like 30, 30 feet. 30 feet, feet? Bottom within the bridge. With oh. the bridge. On the whole. That's a good sound. Nobody even knows that. Yeah, with that with that teaser, we have a a, a draft first run of the video that we're going to put on the web that we wanted to show the Brad as, as we start, we start rolling out. out. Beginning winter 2023 and 2024, the Maryland Transportation Authority will begin the first section of phase one of the eastbound deck replacement of the Bay Bridge. Some areas of the deck are nearly 50 years old and have reached the end of their service life. The MDTA has designed a construction solution to limit traffic impacts while maximizing safety for our contractors and customers. During regular overnight bridge closures, portions of the bridge deck will be removed via cranes from the water. Then the cranes will install new deck panels that have been manufactured off-site and barged in. Two-way traffic will operate on the westbound bridge during overnight work, and the eastbound bridge will reopen in time for morning commuters. Crews will then utilize off-peak lane closures during the day to get work areas ready for successful night shifts. Your safety is always the MDTA's priority. Please pay attention to the road ahead and obey overhead lane use signals at all times, and remember to always drive and boat safely in work zones. Learn more at baybridge.com. Good. That's that's a draft version. So as soon as we get the final version, I'll share that. Beginning <laughs> with. Moving right along. <laughs> um, real quick update. You, you, he asked me if I was going ahead of you, and I said ladies first. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just finishing out for MDTA. <laughs> Um, just wanted to give a real quick update on the um, Bay Crossing study, Tier 2 NEPA. <laughs> a lot of ongoing work. Bay Crossing study, Tier 2 NEPA. 
is NEPA. NEPA, I'm sorry. NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act. Basically, that's the study that we're doing looking at a potential new crossing of the bridge. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to start over. <laughs> I'm sorry. My name is Melissa Williams. I'm the Director of Planning and Program Development at MDTA. I'm also working on the project, which is the National Environmental Policy Act Bay Crossing Study Tier 2 National Environmental Policy Act Study. We're looking at a new crossing of the bridge. What I'm I'll pop up line, but, but we're going to talk about the website because that's where you're going to get a good bunch of the information that you'll want to see to kind of catch up with us. But um, just wanted to give a, a quick update on where we are. We have a lot of ongoing work right now. Um, environmental field studies, ongoing coordination with state and federal environmental and resource agencies, again, ongoing. We're still working on traffic. Um, we, As you know, we did our counts last year uh, in 20, like 2023, um, summer and fall 2023, looking at our existing conditions. We're looking at analyzing the traffic that we collected, in queue, including looking at queue lengths as well as duration of those queue lengths and looking at not just our peak periods, but at 24 hours a day. We're looking at the different traffic patterns that we have. Um, as far as our projected traffic, which will be the year 2045, our no-build conditions, we are looking at forecasting the traffic volumes and also forecasting the traffic operations, again, looking at the queue lengths, durations projected for in the future. Um, one of my favorite things, we've also, we are also looking at our origins and destinations, working with reconciling that information with the vendor we're using, which is called Streetlight and um, ensuring that we have good data and that um, we have a good feeling for where vehicles are coming from and going to. Our next steps will include uh, forecasting volumes for 2024-2045 build conditions. So as we begin developing alternatives, which is where we are right now, developing actual lines on paper for where a crossing might be, we will then be projecting traffic volumes for those different alternatives. Development of alternatives is a big effort, part of what we're working on right now. A um, little bit of a precursor, we will be sharing those alternatives and showing those lines on paper late summer, early fall of 2024, and we'll said next year, but this year, we will be sharing that information with the public. So a little bit backwards, a little bit forwards. The backwards is, remember, we had those public meetings in September of 2023. Well, we have our summary from those meetings, our summary of public comment and public input from those um, meetings, the two in person and one online meeting. That's good information for you to catch up with. <laughs> our website is baycrossingstudy.com. And um, just wanted to point out a couple of highlights um, about that study, about the, um, the comment summary. I really encourage you folks to go to the website and take a look at the comment summary. Um, it's 56 pages, don't be intimidated. Lots of graphs, charts, things like that. It's a quick read, um, but we did get 611 uh, individual pieces of input from folks, um, individual people commenting. So that's great. We were really happy with the interaction that we had. Um, just wanted to point out some of the questions, some of the data that I thought was interesting. Our very first question was, what's your zip code? Which doesn't seem like a very interesting question, but what it showed us was we had a good, I'm going to say like almost 33%, like a third was Anne Arundel, a third was Queen Anne, and a third was Otter. So I thought that was really good. We got a great distribution of folks responding. So that's always one of the concerns is do we have um, skewed data? But it showed that we had a really good cross-section of individuals. Um, looking at why we're doing the study, people really agree that the most important need is adequate capacity and having reliable travel times. So I feel like um, the folks that we reach, we're on the same page. We're looking for the same, we're looking for solutions to the same problem. How often do you cross the bridge? This one I thought was interesting. We had a really good mix of people from daily, weekly, monthly, infrequently. So I feel like we got a full range of input from your daily commuter to your seasonal travel, uh, your, your summer traveler. 
so that was interesting. Again, that just shows that we got a really good range of information. Pat, you're going to want to hear this one. Do you use local roads to avoid congestion on US 5301? Yes. Guess what percent of the people said yes? 60%. So, Pat, you tell us this all the time, and folks tell us this all the time, but it was confirmed 60% of the people said, yep, I do it. Yep. So I thought that was, I thought that was kind of interesting and telling, you know. Um, whole bunch of other information, a whole bunch of other data. Like I said, it's 56 pages long, but it's a really quick read. It's good information. There are questions about transit. There are questions about bicycle pedestrian access. Would you use it? Wouldn't you use it? Why would you use it? Lots of really good questions. And I think the input that people gave is um, very interesting and um, helps us, like I said, based on the cross section of individuals that we got, I think we got our, got really good input that helps give us the full picture of, of input in the study area and beyond the study area. So again, baycrossingstudy.com survey uh, summary, please review. Homework item number two, if anyone would like us to attend a community group to discuss the project, give a project briefing, Pat, let us know. Anybody else, let us know. We're always available to come out and talk to you. We um, There are certain times of the year or up throughout the project that are really good for us to come out to the public. And having just had a public meeting in September and having some good fresh data and information to share, we're really happy to come out. This is a great time for us to come out. Come late summer when we're preparing for another public meeting is not as good of a time. So this is this is really a great time for us to come out. Um, John, as I said, we will talk offline, but um, I would suggest that you take a look at our website. There's a lot of good information there. Um, one of the keys is making sure that we are hearing the public and hearing what people have to say and input from a good cross section. And um, I'm really happy with these survey results. I feel like we, we are achieving that goal throughout the project. We are looking at two things, equity, but equity in our process, as well as in our project delivery and in the project itself. And we're really focusing on our process right now. And um, that's what we're going to make sure we're reaching all of the communities. So really happy with what we have so far and hope we continue. Very good, thank you. All right, the better looking, I, I would, would <laughs> email now that the better Definitely looking, not. Actually, yeah. wait, you, you did age before you <laughs> Well, again, for the record, I'm Will Pine, State Highway Administrator. Um, I got a couple of updates since the last meeting. I want to thank Terry for covering for me at the last meeting. I wasn't able to be here. She's our Deputy Administrator and will likely be my backup or answer any questions that I can today. But um, Good job, buddy. I know. Okay. I, I, know. Very good. Uh, I just had another conflict with another meeting that evening, so sorry I wasn't able to make it. But. Um, two updates on um, ongoing signal projects, one at Maryland 178 at Pleasant Plains. Uh, we temporarily had a pause in the construction there that was associated with some resolving some questions from a property owner near the signal. Uh, we worked through that now and we're expecting that construction will resume in the next couple of weeks, which we anticipate being able to have that signal done by um, prior to the start of the summer. And then uh, Maryland 179 Bush Frontage Road, the, the design is underway for that with the goal, again, of having the signal fully operational prior to the Memorial Day weekend. And as you're thinking about it, that's the signal that has the flashing red and uh, four way stop there. We're converting that to a fully signalized intersection to help deal with the ramp management, additional volume coming through that intersection. We do, we have started looking at resurfacing Whitehall Road and East College Parkway, but the timing of the resurfacing will be dependent on available funding. At this point, we don't have funding to do it, and that's largely because it is considered a local, even though it's owned by State Highway, it's a local road that does not qualify for federal funding. So it does rely on state money, and that is the hardest money to get right now. So. Um, we know we have been evaluating the need and are looking to figure out when we can program that. Uh, in terms of the ramp management pilots or the, the programs that we've had on the two shores, starting on the western shore, we expect to resume that again this year. 
will likely start about two weeks prior to Memorial Day. That is when we also start our normal ESTO system where we internally ramp up to get ready for the summer season. Um, approximately for the first month of the ramp pilot, we're going to try this year to make an adjustment to where we leave exit 30 open. We did attend the Broadnet Council meeting and got some feedback that there was possibly that wasn't a desirable scheme. Um, we think that the uh, obviously a lot of whether or not the rent management system is effective is whether or not the uh, apps, Waze, Google are diverting folks onto the local roads. We think that by closing exit 31 permanently and 32 um, on those weekend closures on Fridays and Saturdays, that we will be able to get most of the traffic to stay off of the local roads consistent with how it has been. However, we heard the feedback loud and clear that if that isn't successful and folks are utilizing um, Whitehall and getting off trying to use that left at exit 30 and then that that backs up from locals being able to get through that we're going to be prepared to adjust. We're going to try it for a month, see if it works. That will allow us to utilize less resources. This is a very resource intensive operation for us. We have a lot of folks coming in with trucks and people that sit there for an entire weekend. They're not accomplishing mowing. They're not accomplishing litter removal. They're not accomplishing all of the other things that folks want us to do uh, and instead are sitting there watching what typically at this point is empty roadways. Um, so we want to try to see if we can scale back on how intensive those operations are, see if they are still effective. If they're not, we'll make the audible and make the adjustment to resume that closure of 30. But so likely for that, the first several weekends, we're going to try to just close exit 32 with 31 being permanently closed, and we'll do that on Fridays and Saturday mornings. That will um, remain in place. Uh, we expect similarly to last year, it'll be unmanned over the evenings. However, we do leave the closures up with the signing and everything overnight because of the amount of time that it takes to deploy all of that. It's just easier to uncover and resume that. So that is the, the plan for the Western Shore, for the Eastern Shore, um, as I mentioned earlier, we did do a traffic study that correlated with the, the temporary periods that we did last year. Um, we, we have provided that study to the county. We plan to meet with them in February to review that. Based on the findings from that, that traffic information, we will plan to have some public engagement, likely resuming some form of the ramp management pilot. We did kind of, as was uh, mentioned here, we did get some um, negative feedback and positive feedback, both sides of it. The majority of the positive feedback was seen to be more from residents on the um, kind of to the Eastern side and along 18 that are most impacted by the 18 traffic. Uh, the residents that tended to be on Route 8, down Route 8, down the route eight and, and kind of especially, um, I guess that's on the southern side there, they tended to um, feel more negatively about it. So we're going to review that, kind of talk about um, that, how to balance that out, but likely will anticipate having some kind of similar ramp management pilot to, to what was done last year. Um, there were discussions about extending that much further back. That would be to the detriment of those Route 8 users. So we think that doing a lot of different ramp pilot options is probably not likely, um, but we'll, we'll make sure we flush that out with the county and then with the public and a little further. So yeah, there was a question about you know, Northern Brooklyn, getting people leaving to go to the Eastern Shore, having to go all the way up and come back. Was that a good way to address that? Yeah, on the Western Shore, I did. I didn't say that overtly, but one of the things last year we had done Thursdays and Fridays, so we're we're expecting to coordinate with Northrop Grumman, not no longer do Thursdays, just do Fridays and Saturdays, and that would allow them to have their folks telework on Fridays and have the other day to be able to kind of use their, their more normal commute. So 
we got a on the western sh shore we got a little bit of negative feedback from a few businesses um uh, some of the council county council had relayed that feedback to us uh and then north of Bremen. but generally it was a lot more positive on the western shore than the negative um so we're really just looking at primarily the same operation scaled back a little bit kind of trying to balance the positive and negative feedback that we're getting to see. It's, it's really kind of the same thing. At some point, we'll probably stop calling a pilot and say that this is something we're going to do more regularly, um, but we want to sort of play with the hours. We know that like Thursdays, accommodating north of Grumman, there will certainly be some Thursdays, holiday weekends where the Thursday may still be problematic. One of the things that we've seen with the ramp pilots is we have to coordinate with the apps ahead of time for them to efficiently close it. It's not a thing where we can just close it and it automatically shows up. Um, so we it's we can't make an audible all the time. We have to plan ahead and announce it and do do the uh, coordination up front for it to be effective. But when we do that, then they do actually publicly show that the ramps are closed. But we can't trick them out either. The second that that thing reopens and they see the Bluetooth start driving the ramp, it's over and they'll they'll show that it's resumed. So you're not going to close the ramp on Sundays. Thirty two. Correct. No. Look, typically the predominant movement on Sundays is westbound. Yeah. So we're expecting to do the pilot or the ramp management on the eastern shore on sat like. We'll flip basically Fridays and then into the like Saturday midday, we would do the the Western Shore and then flip over after that point and do the Eastern Shore Saturday, later day into Sunday on the Eastern Shore, kind of coinciding with the predominant traffic. Have we ever done a ramp pilot or yeah, I'm sure you have looked at the traffic patterns on Thursday? versus Friday, because to me, it seems like, and it always has, that the traffic on 97 headed towards the shore is always heavier on Thursday than it is on Friday. And that was even before the pandemic. So I just. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I can't speak off the top of my head on 97 proper, but um, I, we could come to another brag meeting and show you sort of the daily volumes, but I think Fridays historically have been the dominant <laughs> I just for, for the movement to post on the Eastern Shore. Thank you. Other questions? All right, next agenda items unfinished business. So, I have a recap of the Bay Bridge run. I can now turn the floor over to Bay Bridge Administrator James Turner. So good evening, I'm James Turner. I'm your facility administrator here at Bay Bridge. Uh, I'll keep this short and sweet. Um, just a quick summary of 2023 bridge run. Um, it was held on Sunday, November 12th. Overall, it went very well. It turned out to be a successful event. Um, there were just over 15,000 participants that finished the race. Uh, we were able to reopen the eastbound bridge and return to normal operations uh, prior to noon that Sunday and only had minor delays reaching approximately one mile each direction. So overall it went well. Uh, most of the feedback was pretty positive on the event and uh, we're currently looking at potential dates for next year's run and we'll of course update the group once we get a date locked in. Thank you. All right, so we have new, new, no items of new business were submitted prior to the meeting. So now, even for any member who wishes to bring the new business to the group, we don't have any business being brought forward. We're seeing none, we'll move on to public comments. Do you have any public comments? Over the floor to the public. We're going to, next we have. Our next meeting will schedule to take place on Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024 at 6 p.m. May I please have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn. Second. So I move. Thank you all for attending. Not too late. Exactly not that. Exactly.